As I mentioned, I spent this week up uh, at this summer camp, and it was, I think there were four churches that were participating. It was us, Good Shepherd down in Sandy, uh, Our Saviors in Roy, and The Fellowship also in Sandy. And the theme of the camp was being transformed by God. Uh, We spent some time looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So as you can understand, after spending a whole week talking about nothing but transformation, I kind of have it on my, on my brain still. Um, and the, the way we talked about transformation was comparing it to a tree. Uh, you plant a tree, you have to have good soil, then it puts down roots, it starts to grow, it grows leaves, and then if it's a fruit tree, which we were kind of assuming it was, it starts to bear fruit. And if you do everything right, you get a good portion of fruit from the tree and everyone is happy. So we started by talking about the roots, how the root of obedience, the roots of transformation are obedience, perseverance, and self-control. And then, of course, the goal is for our fruit to feed others. And it, was, it struck me when I was looking at the texts for this week how much this difference between transforming or being transformed by God and conforming to the world fits with what our readings are this week, especially when it comes to Solomon. Now, Solomon was kind of an interesting case. He was the second son of David and Bathsheba, the first son having died in his infancy after, well, we all know what David did with Bathsheba. Solomon's reign started out by having to shut down a rebellion by his brother Adoniah, who was actually closer to firstborn than Solomon was. Solomon was at least the fifth son. Uh, Adoniah, I think, is if my Hebrew is close. He was the fourth son. Um, and see, the, the third son was the infant that died. The second son was a fellow named Amnon, who was killed by his brother, the firstborn, Absalom, because Amnon thought it was a good idea to rape his half-sister. Absalom didn't take too kindly for it, so Absalom killed him. David's family was a little bit messed up, um, which is actually exactly what Nathan said would happen after he, well, we all know what he did with David, and we all know what happened with Bathsheba. So Solomon One night, he finds himself in Gibeon. He is going to make a sacrifice to God there. And as he's sleeping, he has a dream where God shows up and says, Hey, Solomon, what do you want? I'll give it to you. Now, Solomon, who is about 40 at this point, says, God, I'm like a little child. I don't know what I'm doing. How about wisdom? Wisdom sounds good. God said, ooh, I like that plan. I will give you wisdom. And because you asked for wisdom and not wealth and honor and such, I'm going to give you that too. So that no one would equal him as a king in his lifetime so long as he continues to follow God and to keep God's teaching. Ah, there's the catch. So long as he continues to follow God. Now, Solomon was doing good for a while. He wrote three books of the Old Testament. He probably wrote Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. And he wrote one book of the Old Testament Apocrypha, the Wisdom of Solomon. He also was the one who happened to build the first temple, which was kind of a big deal. But as time went on, um, let's just say Solomon's wisdom started to fail him a touch. Um, he married at least 700 times, uh, had 300 additional concubines, and 1 Kings chapter 11 says that those wives turned Solomon to their gods and away from God. Solomon also managed to collect enormous wealth for himself. Uh, He collected 666 talents of silver every year. That's a lot. I didn't do the math, but it's a lot. Um, also, the 
cuteness of that number can't be avoided either. But it is perfectly imperfect. Three sixes, six, seven is the number of perfection, six is the number of imperfection. Put three of them together, it's perfectly imperfect. He also accumulated a vast military for himself with horses and chariots and, of course, the collection of wives. Curiously enough, in Deuteronomy 17, verses 16 and 17, those are three things that it explicitly says that when the people have a king for themselves, he shouldn't do that. He shouldn't collect a whole lot of wealth for himself. He shouldn't collect a whole lot of horses and military strength for himself. And he shouldn't collect a whole lot of wives for himself lest they lead the king's heart astray. Kind of funny that God saw that one coming. So for all of Solomon's wisdom, it seems as though he wasn't so much transformed as conformed to the patterns of everyone around him. In fact, God was so displeased by by Solomon's behavior in his later life that his son, Rehoboam, lost rule over 12 or 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel when leading, led to the split between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was a mess of assassinations and military dictatorships and all kinds of chaos. And the southern kingdom was a mess, but at least David's throne, or David's line continued to rule there, at least until the Babylonians showed up. So Solomon's story is a warning to us of what happens when, even if we're wise, we don't pay attention to God. Psalm 119 even reminds us that the uh, reminds us of the importance of listening to God for direction instead of listening to ourselves and reminding us that God's word brings light to darkness, understanding to the simple. <laughs> you got to love the Bible sometimes. They won't just flat out translate it stupid, but they'll say simple because somehow that's better. And it leads to sin not having power over us. Paul expands on this writing from his perspective after God's word became flesh in Jesus and the Holy Spirit showed up to all people. He had just finished explaining the difficulty of living as a Christian in this world, how the things that he wants to do, he doesn't do. The things that he doesn't want to do, he does. Who can save me from this body of death? Sunday school answer, please. Jesus. God, Jesus. I was with youth all week. I'm used to them just, the only three answers they know are God, Jesus, and the Bible. And if you ask him a question with one of those answers, they've got a one in three chance, which is actually pretty good. Paul starts out this section of Romans explaining that the Spirit helps us when we are weak. The Spirit keeps us on track even when the world tries to get in the way. Whether it's death or life, angels or demons, present or future, powers, height, depth, or just about anything else anywhere. This is the kind of transformation that God promises to those who grow close to him. It's the kind of thing that would lead a man to sell everything he has to buy a field that happens to have a treasure in it. It's the kind of thing that would lead a merchant to sell everything he has to buy a pearl. It's the transformation like a mustard seed. And if you've ever seen a mustard seed, I I like the kind of mustard that still has the seeds in it, so I run across this a lot. They're really about that big right? Have you ever seen a mustard plant? They're bigger, quite a bit bigger. So the transformation that God wants to bring in us is to take something like a little seed and make it into a rather significant sized tree. It's the kind of transformation that, I know several of you make bread. How much yeast do you need in a loaf of bread? Not much. It's a small bit of yeast that makes a whole lot of bread rise. We need to trust in the Holy Spirit in our lives to transform us so that it becomes easier to follow God than to conform to the world. We can take that caution from Solomon's story, but we also can take comfort in the promises that God has given us through Paul's writing. That even though the world wants to do everything it can to keep us away from God, it really can't do all that much. Nothing that the world can throw at us 
can keep us from God. And yet there is one thing. Nothing the world throws at us can keep us from God. But we can. One of the things that Pastor Chip said this week from our saviors in Roy, the only thing that can stop God moving in your life is you. You ever thought thought about it that way? That's actually how Paul starts out the book of Romans, by saying that we can choose not God. He then spends the whole rest of Romans explaining why that's a completely daft and silly idea. But just like the Holy Spirit and God's word brings understanding to the simple, the Holy Spirit wants to bring us to that knowledge that life with God is better. That to be transformed by God is better than being conformed to the world. So that we can know what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. That we can avoid the traps that the world tries to set for us. And that we can be transformed in his spirit. That we can follow his will and finally know that through it all, we have the promises of forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life, and freedom in our Lord and Savior.